Yeah, I know. Uh, what words, right? Well, I hope that our panel challenges preconceived notions about who has served, who is serving, and who should be allowed to serve in the United States military. And that all of you are inspired to become advocates for justice, equality, diversity, and inclusion in the military and society. By the way, that is the coolest hashtag ever, hashtag Jedi. Um, feel free to IG and tweet about this panel and to actually uh, tag us too. My Twitter is hfrankie, H-F-R-A-N-Q-U-I. Lieutenant Colonel Mendoza will explore the practical need for a more for more flexible policies when it comes to naturalization in the military. And Dr. Duxford will give us concrete samples of what ethnic and racial underrepresented groups have done serving in the military and why it's important that their experience is recognized in all its complexity. It is even more important that we understand that a more diverse and inclusive military means a safer country and a better society. So to my point, I want you all to ask yourself, what does America's heroes look like? Imagine yourself being a kid wanting to be a superhero, but not seeing anyone like you portraying comics, stories, movies, or TV. At least not portray as heroes. Imagine that you live in a world in which those who look and sound like you are instead portrayed as villains, terrorists, criminals, and rapists the enemy. Sounds horrible, right? Now think that about, think about despite all of that, you still being willing to serve and sacrifice your life for your native or, adop or adoptive country, just to have that country not loving you back. So let me say this, no black man can be Captain America and no self-respecting African-American to want to be it either. That is the advice that S.A.L. Bradley, an African-American Korean war veteran and super soldier who was in prison and experimented on for 30 years by his own government has for Sam Wilson, AKA the Falcon in the Disney Marvel series, The Falcon and the Winter, Sol Winter Soldiers. And yes, we're discussing Captain America, bear with me. So I'll repeat, no black man can be Captain America and no self-respecting African-American should want to be it either, right? That line is a lot, especially considering that Steve Rogers, the original cab, had asked Sam, the African-American airman who became his right hand and best friend to accept the chill and become the new Captain America, right? What happened to our country that an army guy is asking an airman to take his place, right? That's just some comic relief, so check. But in all seriousness, the shield, right? The shield, mind you, is supposed to represent America itself and the best of us. Here's the question. Is America ready for a black Captain America? More importantly, can Sam make peace with being Captain America and carrying the symbol of an America that does not value him as a person? Can he still fight for the country he loves, but that doesn't fully accept him? How can Sam carry the shield for a country that treats him and those who look like him as second-class citizens at best and like criminals way too often? A country that criminalizes him when he's not in uniform. Or strike that, a country that criminalizes him even while in uniform. Even when representing America, Black, Latino, Asian, and women soldiers are not immune to racism and bigotry, as the case of Afro-Latino Army 2nd Lieutenant Caron Nazario, who was stopped at a gas station while in uniform, disrespected and pepper sprayed by police officer a couple months ago in Virginia, painfully reminds us. But back to the cap. Sam worries are not just timely. They're almost universal, and they resonate with Black and Latino immigrant women and gay and lesbian service members who have been disrespected and have seen their rights violated in and out of uniform. This series are about present day United States of America and they focus on Black Lives Matters, why anxiety, 
xenophobia, nativism, and more importantly, the series main message is the hope that America can still achieve justice and equality for all. I share that hope, the hope that America can steal justice and equality for all of us. And it starts here with the military, because like it or not, this institution is supposed to represent the best our society has to offer. Now that I told you the moral imperative for the military to be ahead of the curve when it comes to inclusion and diversity, let me give you the practical one. The military is the perfect social laboratory, as sociology Charles Moskos once called it, because of the executive power of the commander in chief. With the stroke of a pen, photos can advance justice, equality, diversity, and inclusion. Or dial it back. Coronel Mendoza's paper teaches a dialing back, most recently from the previous administration, using the military to try nativist and xenophobic policies. There are many examples of racist, xenophobic, and nativist policies for being first being tried in the military. This is not the first time. For example, African American leaders exhorted their uh, African American leaders exhorted their fellow Black American to participate in the War of 1898 with Spain, hoping it would lead to the opening of the officer corps to Black men. The opposite happened as Southern whites came to dominate the military the officer corps was close to black men, their numbers harshly limited in the army and their service restricted to that of labor troops. African-Americans tried again in World War I and despite the Woodrow Wilson administration not be willing to condemn lynchings and his administration xenophobic and anti-immigrant campaign, the black community adopted a policy of first your country, then your rights and of close ranks with our fellow white citizens. Hundreds of dozens of Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, and immigrants did, did the same. First their country, then their rights. We know about the famous Harlem Hellfighter, the 369 uh, unit from New York, which also included Black Puerto Rican, Haitians, and men from the Virgin Islands. They saw combat under French command and received accolades and decorations, spent more time on the line than any other American unit, and taught the Germans to fear them. And all that, just to be almost forgotten after the war, to be lynched while in uniform, just to see the military, and just to see the military redoubling its effort to keep black and non-white soldiers, like the tens of thousands of Puerto Ricans who volunteered to fight in World War I, out of the military, away from officer commissions, and limited to labor and support roles. World War II came, and America again adopted racist policies, limiting the type of service non-white could perform. And again, individuals and community leaders, Black, Puerto Rican, Hispanics, and Mexican-Americans fought for the right to fight for the country and for the freedom and democracy denied to them at home. While hundreds of thousands of recent immigrants from oppressed countries, including Poles, Italians, Jews from all over Europe, volunteered to make sure that America did not fall prey to fascism. We know about the Tuskegee Airmen and the famous, and the famous red tail of the 99 Percy and Fighter Squadron. They fought at a time when Nazi POWs were treated better than blacks in the South and in most of the North. But we only know because of their exceptional record and motion pictures. And we also know because they were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal decades after their service. The Tuskegee Airmen, just like the PMO Marines, were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, not just for their outstanding record, but because they served gallantly at a time when lynching was common and racial segregation the norm, and because they disproved the myth of racial inferiority and unfitness for military service. They're not alone in this. The medal has also been awarded to the Navajo code talkers, who at a time where the language was prohibited in school because it wasn't a Christian language, used that very same criminalized language for communications in the battlefield, saving countless American lives in the process. This selected group of Congressional Gold Medal awardees is joined by Japanese American who volunteered to join the army and requested combat duty and served with the 442nd Infantry Regiment demonstrating the loyalty to the United States of America 
their country, their home, while the, while the families of many remain in internment camps. And the loyalty was only doubted because of their ethnicity. In that decorated group, we also have the tens of thousands of Puerto Rican soldiers known as the Borinqueniers, the 65th US Army Infantry Regiment, who during the Korean War were willing to pay the ultimate price at a time when Puerto Ricans were openly labeled in the press academic circles and by government officials as a problem to be dealt with, all because of their increasing numbers. And this is a perfect example of how xenophobia, nativism, and racism are mutually supported. For Puerto Ricans are not from a distinctive race, but are racialized as such. They're not immigrants, neither they cross the border. The border crossed in 1898, just like it crossed hundreds of thousands of Mexican and Hispanics as the US expanded its territory. Yet they're still constructed as undeserving immigrants. And still to this day, Puerto Ricans are twice as likely to serve in the military than the general population of the United States. So, okay, before this becomes too celebratory and we lose focus thinking, yeah, they got their medals and recognize, woohoo, let me say something. Don't, don't do it. Rather, I want you to think about this. Those soldiers, Marine and aviators were recognized because of how incredibly exceptional their service was, which is even more so when we think about how society and the military viewed them and treated them. But they were not alone. Millions more like them did the same. They just didn't get a movie or a book highlighting their achievements and sacrifices for a country that didn't see them as equals. All these men and women who have worn the uniform, even after experiencing the harshest form of discrimination and racism, understand what the new Captain America stands for. And like Sam, they stood for the country, their communities, and for justice and equality. And they're still standing next to you. You know them, you have met them. Some of you have served with them. Some of you are them. In, this, in his presentation, Lieutenant Colonel Mendoza will go over the practical issues regarding a more diverse military. And he will focus on what immigrants have sacrificed to be accepted and to defend their adoptive country. What I want to leave you with this is the military is that force, that shield representing the best we are and the best we can be. It should represent all of us. It should be the most inclusive institution, as it is in many ways. It should never be soiled with racism, xenophobia, bigotry, and nativism. That is for fascists. Our military exists to defend our constitution, our democracy, and our people. Back to Captain America. The question remains, can Sam pick up that American symbol and continue to be himself? Can he pick up that shield without betraying his community? Can he carry the shield that symbolizes a country that has enslaved, oppressed, and abused his community and many other? Never mind being Captain American, can he truly be accepted as a person in the country he loves? He's answering that question for all of us. He's answering this question the same way that millions of African-American, Latinos, Native American, immigrant, women, gay, and lesbian says service members have answered it. And his answer is, yes, I can. Yes, we can. They have done it and they continue to do it to this very same day. One can only hope that the message in this series becomes mainstream and that our communities make common cause to end bigotry, nativism, xenophobia, and racism and that together we create a better United States of America, one in which anyone can be the cap and represent the best of us all with or without a shield, in or out of uniform. Until then, let's make sure that our military truly represent all of us and the best of us. Thank you and I leave you with Colonel Dan. Thank you so much, Dr. Frankie, uh, for those incredible insights. Uh, I really love the way you open this up and this fundamental question about what our American heroes should look like is critical to everything that we're seeing and experiencing today as a society. And it has deeply affected how the US government has incorporated its non-citizen immigrants into its armed forces. As a student this past year at the Air War College, I took a close look at this topic. 
And I want you to take away three critical points. The first one, since its founding, America has depended on its immigrants for national defense. Number two, current policies are too restrictive, preventing highly skilled immigrants from joining the service and produce results that are counter to our American values. And point three, we will continue to depend on the American immigrant population to ensure America's national defense in the future. Now, the United States, since its founding, has depended upon immigrants to defend its country. During the Revolutionary War, the US depended on French and Prussian born soldiers to lead their troops and defeat the British. During the Civil War, one out of every four Union Army soldiers was foreign born. If you include the additional 18% of Union soldiers that had at least one foreign born parent, there's almost 43% of the entire Union Army having immigrant origins. Since World War I, over 760,000 foreign born men and women have enlisted and obtained their citizenship through military service. And their service was fought bravely throughout each one of America's major conflicts. Consider that more than 20% of all US Medal of Honor recipients are foreign born. This was no different immediately following the devastating attacks of 9-11 as the military scrambled to find qualified personnel with the critical skills needed to fight the global war on terrorism. In that following decade, the Department of Defense created special programs such as the Military Accessions Vital to the National Interest, otherwise known as MAVNI, which enlisted over 10,400 immigrants to fill critical shortfalls in the military, serving as interpreters, medical technicians, combat engineers, and special operations personnel. They included not just traditional green card holders, but also our DREAMers, our DACA recipients, immigrants who have been granted asylum, refugee status, or even those who were granted a temporary work or student visa. Today, approximately 40,000 immigrants currently serve in our armed forces, with an average of 7,000 enlisting each year. And we have over 2.4 million veterans who are of immigrant origin. Despite this proven history of immigrant service, recent policies issued in 2017 severely limited highly skilled immigrants from joining the armed forces and produced results that were counter to our American values. Underlying these policy changes was an enduring fear of foreign infiltration of the US armed forces and questioning the true loyalty of foreign born US military members that has surfaced time and time again throughout American history. Some of these were such as the questionable government practices that targeted Japanese and Chinese immigrants through World War II and the Red Scare of the 1950s. These new policies effectively froze programs like MAVNI by adding excessive vetting requirements on top of routine background checks. Before these new policies, immigrant recruits could go ahead and enlist and ship out to basic training right away while the standard security background checks were being conducted. Once these were completed and they were done with basic training, they could earn their certificate of honorable service, deploy to their first assignment, and were eligible for citizenship once their background checks were complete. Today, once an immigrant takes their oath of enlistment, which they must complete four different security checks before they can go to basic training. This includes the same tier five level background investigation required for American citizens to obtain a top secret clearance. This entire process can take an average of 400 days to complete. These new changes have put over 4,000 immigrant recruits in limbo waiting for the security checks to be finalized. Additionally, over 1,000 of these recruits ended up losing their temporary legal status while they're waiting for basic training, putting them at risk for deportation. I want you to imagine being an immigrant in the US and wanting to serve and defend your new home you enlist and you take the oath of enlistment, which is similar to the oath required for US citizenship, and you wait for over a year to go to basic training, but you love this country so much and you want to serve, you attend monthly unit drills with your reserve unit and you're attending school so that you can finish your degree. But instead of going to basic training, you are discharged with no notification or specific details on why you were discharged, just as the army did to 502 men and women who enlisted through MAVNI from 2017 to 2018. 
Now, many of these multiple investigations found that many of these discharges were due to what's considered foreign ties. So if you're an immigrant recruit here in the United States, and if you've kept contact with your immediate family overseas, those are grounds to be discharged from military service. This exact thing happened to Panchu Sho, who was discharged from the army in 2018 due to his connection with his immediate family who still resided in China. Sho came to the US to study in 2010 and enlisted in 2016. He was serving the Army Reserve as he completed his graduate degree in the US. Sho had the critical skills and education that our military desperately needed, and he was pursuing his PhD at Texas A&M when he was discharged without notification. Having already taken an oath of enlistment to the US military, Sho and his family back in China were worried about his safety if he was deported, as his father was already being harassed by Chinese authorities due to his son's enlistment. Also, because of these new policy changes, this has led to approximately 2,000 veterans being deported out of the United States. I say approximately because the US government does not have an accurate account. A 2019 congressional investigation found that ICE, or the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, did not consistently follow their own protocols from 2013 to 2018. So as they were deporting these immigrants, they were not verifying whether or not they were veterans. They were not taking their military service into consideration. And many of these veterans who were deported had service-related injuries, such as PTSD, or had committed a misdemeanor or nonviolent crime, which had led to their deportation. So I want you to consider that even though they had a, dis a honorable discharge and had served honorably to their country, to the United States, they're currently deported and the only way that they can come back is if they are deceased and their remains can come back to the United States where they would receive full military honors. Our military cannot afford to throw away highly skilled people like Sho or veterans who have served simply because they do not fit our preconceived notions of what American heroes should look like. And this comes to my last point. We will continue to depend on the American immigrant population to ensure America's national defense in the future. Multiple studies conducted both by civilian and military organizations from 2009 to 2017 have found that almost 75% of young Americans were unqualified for military service, many due to medical issues, being overweight, or for disqualifying felony convictions. And it's not just that there are less qualified Americans today capable of serving, but there will be fewer Americans overall to sustain the American labor force. A 2019 report found that the US fertility rate was 16% below the target required for national labor replacement. And the US Census Bureau recently identified a shortfall of 50 million people necessary to sustain the American labor force through 2050. So where are these future military service members going to come from? Well, they're already here. U.S. Census study recently found that over 1.2 million immigrants already have the medical, education, and language requirements needed for military service right now in this country. If we include temporary status immigrants like DACA, Dreamers, and refugees, that number goes up to 5.8 million. And multiple private service U.S. government civilian agencies have identified huge shortfalls across medical, healthcare, and cybersecurity expertise. We need foreign born service members. They tend to hold higher academic qualifications, perform better and serve longer than their US peers. Someone like Sergeant Saral Sharessa, who arrived from Nepal when he was 17 and joined the army at 21. He was the US Army's 2012 Soldier of the Year, beating out 23 other top notch soldiers in a four day grueling competition. If we want to maintain our competitive edge, we need more soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marine like Sergeant Shrestha. We need more immigrants in our military. I'd like to close with a quick story. When I was a little kid, one of my favorite things to do was wear this Winnie the Pooh blanket as a cape. Uh, this cape had pictures of Winnie the Pooh holding on balloons and I tied around my neck. And anywhere I went, I pretended to fly around like Superman because all I wanted to do was defend my family, to protect people, and to serve. And my mom put up with all of it. Even when we went out shopping, I was there wearing my cape. And she would always tell me, 
that you can do and be whomever you want to be in this country. And this was odd considering that my parents had immigrated from Bolivia and had been living in the US illegally for almost 10 years. I was seven years old when immigration came to our apartment to take our family away. There was no question that we were going to be deported. But as we're going through the proceedings, I want you to imagine my mother, all four foot 11 inches of her, standing in front of an immigration judge, explaining to them why our family was good enough to stay here. She even showed him my report card saying that I had a future here in the country and that I could contribute. It just so happened that the only time the US government granted amnesty to immigrants was the Immigration Reform Control Act of 1986. And once that was signed into law, our family was allowed to stay. Experiencing all of that and seeing all the wonderful things in this country, I traded in my Winnie the Pooh blanket cape for a uniform in the United States Air Force and have had the privilege to serve for almost 19 years flying C-130s, providing humanitarian aid and relief all over the world. Even though when I go off base and I'm not in uniform, even though I've been insulted and told repeatedly to go back home to Mexico or not to speak Spanish in public to my family, I'm still proud to serve. And I wear my American flag proudly on my uniform because of what it represents. It's not where we're born, it's not how much money we make, but it's life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the Bill of Rights. These are the ideals and values that bind us as Americans and make us who we are. If we can get past our own fears and preconceptions of what a hero should look like and embrace our immigrant population, embrace all of our diverse members of our American society, then we can truly be ready to defend this great nation together. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Duxworth Lawton. Thank you for this wonderful paper. And I do hope to see it published at some point. And we will talk about that. Uh, for everyone else, Bon Martin. I um, am Dr. Salika Duxworth Lawton. I am a French Creole from Louisiana. And my specialty area is race and national security. I'm a UWEC professor and I'm the ROTC historian for the Northwoods Battalion up here in Wisconsin, as well as on the advisory for H4. And I want to start my short speech because everybody wants to ask their questions, I'm sure, with a little quote from my father-in-law who was a Bronze Star winner in the Korean War, a black man from Arkansas who had to flee Arkansas because of a lynch mob, because lynchers in World War II and Korea especially targeted African-American soldiers in uniform, Latino soldiers in uniform, and Asian-American soldiers who were at the North Carolina and Mississippi bases. So what he said to me when he realized what I studied is that we have always loved the US more than it has loved us, but we will always fight for it. And I think that really discusses, that really encapsulates what we are discussing here. That military service for people who are multicultural, for people who are marginalized, and especially for people who are immigrants, has been a way of earning equality, a way of proving equality, for men before 1973, a way of proving manhood. Because the soldier in US culture is the ultimate citizen, is the ultimate proof of a positive citizenship and manhood. We think of the characteristics that you want from a soldier, that we want somebody who is competent, who is confident, who is assertive in an appropriate way, who can problem solve, who is a self-starter, and who is protective of their family and their nation. Someone who is intelligent enough to be able to operate under gunfire 
but who is also creative enough to be able to use opportunity. These are the things that we want from citizenship. And we have a long history in the US of using military service as a way to access citizenship. You see this in the double V campaigns of the NAACP and black and Asian American soldiers during World War II. We see this with the service of the 101st um, company of the 455th Regiment, the Issei and the Nisei in the Battle of Lost Forest, where they save a Texas Ranger Regiment from being surrounded, they break through and they save them from being annihilated. We see this in the service of the 761st Tank, where we see Jackie Robinson, the famous baseball player as an officer. The 761st Tank is the Black Panther Regiment. They won the Congressional Medal of Honor in the 1970s for their service. And they were the point for Patton's Third Army. While Patton didn't necessarily like Black and Latino service, they were the best. And I have to say that Black and Latino often have meant the same thing. As a French Creole, I am both um, Latin and African-American. My great-grandmother came over the border from Mexico in the 19, in early 1900. So many of the people who were not segregated into the 65th Puerto Rican Regiment were in the 24th or the 25th regiments um, historically, especially or in the 9th and the 10th Cavalry. You saw many multiracial people, especially among the, the Buffalo Soldiers. But they also were involved in the small unit integration of World War II, which led to the larger integration of Korea, or as some of the people I interviewed for my um, dissertation, now book going from Kansas, said the North Koreans made them all run together. So as we look at these cycles of anti-immigrant sentiment, we've seen them in 1840, 1880, 1920, the 1960s and the 1980s. We have to see what this anti-immigrant sentiment robs us of. In terms of national security, we lose unique intelligence and creative assets. On one hand, you look at the indigenous soldiers of the Lakota who use their language to provide an unbreakable code. On the other hand, as we move into Latin American small wars and into the newer wars of the Middle East, it has been mixed race, multiracial people and immigrants who have been the Arabic interpreters, who have been the cultural analysts, and to a large part who have been very important to our um, special forces and our rangers because they can mix in with the population in a way that others cannot, especially if they're native speakers. You know, it, it's not just in the U.S. military that we've lost this capacity. It's also with the NSA and CS, the NSA and the CIA. When we look at the front lines of cyber war, and I have a cousin who's a light colonel in the Air Force who is on it. Um, we're looking at mainly African-American and immigrant soldiers who are the electrical engineers, who are, the, um, com who are doing the cyber combat for us. So by cutting the ability of these people to come into our services, we are cutting our capacity to fight. There is also the creativity of knowing two cultures that allows you to know the weak spots in both. And that creativity allows us to shore up the weak spots 
in our cultural assumptions as we do assumption-based planning, et cetera, for the military, but to exploit the weak spots in other cultures. So by banning, for instance, Eastern Europeans and Russians, we have hampered our capacity to be able to anticipate the attacks on our infrastructure that we are seeing today. And this is, I mean, these are immediate problems that we have to resolve. Starting in the late 1970s, the CIA and the defense intelligence agencies, as well as the US Air Force and US Army began to recruit specifically multiracial people, especially with language capacity, to be able to do intelligence work for us especially if they're rural. When you look at Afghanistan, who is it who's riding a horse out there? You know, that is going to be mainly your immigrants and your multicultural rural people. Because to be honest, most of our suburbanites and our urban people don't know how to do this. So as we look at this, we, we have two fronts. We have the national security front, but we also have the home front. Veterans, immigrant veterans are the first lines of protection for their communities against supremacists like the Ku Klux Klan, but also in forwarding integration. And that's in part because if you have gone through the military, there is no affirmative action stigma. There is a single standard. So you have an assumption of effectiveness. You have an assumption of competence, but you also have training. And that's why segregationists tend to target people in military uniform, like the Lieutenant who was targeted at the gas station. It's because they are in many ways the ultimate threat to those people's ideals of what their entitlement should be. They are the front lines. They lead our communities into an integrated community. If you go to Memphis to the Civil Rights Museum, the first four names on the martyr's wall are soldiers and two of them are like Kearns. And one of them is my father's cousin. So the targeting and the strength it takes to be in a community and to work to make those communities better because veterans are on the front lines of almost every community organization that attempts to make our communities better. So I will stop here because I do not want to get in the way of the people who want to ask their questions. And I will again congratulate like Colonel Mendoza and I will tell Dr. Uh, Franco Rivera, thank you for having me on this panel. Shall we throw this to questions? All right, we don't have any questions posted, but there's been lots of feedback about the conversation in general. Um, so before we wrap up or close this section, are there any closing words or anything, you, any other takeaways that you'd like to give the audience before we close? I did throw an article about integrating the US Army into the chat. And that's from the book, the name of the book is Integrating the US Army. It's a series of articles about how the policy changes, et cetera, um, led to integration. And I think that for people who are interested in this panel, that article would be of interest. So if there are any... No, go ahead. I was just gonna say, if there are any questions, I'm just standing ready for questions. Right. And well, Harry, I just wanted this guy, of course, this is going to happen. If you have anything to say, Harry or Daniel, please go ahead. 
Well, I just wanted to add that um, uh, since we touch on multiculturalism, I, I want to say that nature teaches us that diversity is good, that a diverse ecosystem and biosphere is indicative of a healthy, sustainable system. And multiculturalism is to our country what biodiversity is to environment. The more, uh, and, and for that reason, the more diverse our military is, the healthier our country is, which is actually my, uh, my main point. I see a question in the chat, what's the solution? It's actually a policy issue. Um, the Secretary of Defense can lift these restrictions. They are not written into law. These are administrative rules. So it is our hope that the Biden administration will lift these restrictions and um, change these administrative rules. Now, some of these administrative rules have been attacked by the um, ACLU. You've particularly seen the ones about gay and trans soldiers being attacked. And I know that there is a court case right now involving ACLU, and I am, disclosure, Wisconsin uh, Executive Board of the ACLU. So I know that there is a court case right now against these administrative rules that is in, um, I wanna say it's either third district court or it's in the court that's in Washington, DC. We should write our lawmakers, especially our Republican lawmakers and tell them that these rules are threatening our national security. We need immigrants in the military and in intelligence so that we can be prepared for the kind of attacks that we are seeing right now. Um, as I said, Latin American, especially Latino immigrants, especially would be important in handling some of the issues we have at the border. It's less building a wall and no more knowing who these people are and how to help them. Having Latin, having Latino advisors would help us build better policy towards immigration. When you look at the police and you look at who is causing the most crime, it's not the immigrant communities. They are more likely to be harassed than to be harassers or criminals. What we need is a path to citizenship, something like the 1986 um, Citizenship Act, because right now becoming a citizen is ridiculously hard. As an ACLU person, I am helping a soldier right now who had, he picked up somebody else's pipe and didn't know what it was. He got a citation for drug paraphernalia when he was 18 years old. He is now 35. Every time he goes to Jamaica, he gets held by ICE for eight hours, even though he is a naturalized citizen. So we also need to have some common sense and to talk to our senators, talk to our representatives at the state and the federal level about how, what kind of crimes we should be focusing on. When we focus on parking tickets, yes, I have dealt with those with, with soldiers. When we focus on these minor things, it takes our attention away from major issues. It's a waste of our resources. Um, so we should be writing our senators, talking in writing our representatives and saying, build a path to citizenship, reform the citizenship and refugee process, but especially get rid of these administrative rules, put pressure on the Biden administration to do this. So if you know anybody who's attached to the Biden administration, or if you know anyone who is in either Democratic or Republican parties, get in their faces and talk to them. Have I seen better policy from one branch in the military to the other? These administrative rules are applied to all of the branches. So this problem 
is across the branches. And in, uh, when I say across the branches, I include the Coast Guard. Um, one of my friends right now is the EOS, is the EAO officer for the Coast Guard, and he's trying to work with other um, XOs in order to try to change, to try to push pressure to change these rules across the branches. And I will say that I have talked to my senators. Other questions? This has been an absolutely amazing panel discussion. I actually, I think we have some, something just came up in the chat. Let's check that out real quick. Okay, so I think these two may not be for me. I'm a policy expert, so that's why I took the other one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you all so much for this input. Um, this panel, we've been in our, our little MGM Works world having side conversation about this discussion that's going on now. Um, but thank you all for your time and for your expertise. Daniel, Harry, Salika, thank you so much. Um, we're going to wrap up this session. Um, we're going to have our lunch break for an hour, and then we're going to come back to re-engage at 1 p.m. for our next panel discussion. So thank you all for this uh, absolutely amazing and very informative panel discussion, and thank you for your time.